So, like I said, I'm Mason Schmutz. I'm from, uh, from here originally, attending school at Boston University in the fourth year. And I just want to thank everybody for this opportunity to present to you. Um, I'm going to present on conjunctival melanoma arising from primary acquired melanosis. So this case is actually a case that I encountered working in Dr. Mamelis' lab, a tissue sample that came into us. Um, but it was Mr. S, an 89-year-old male, who was referred for evaluation for a left conjunctival uh, neoplasm. The story was that he had noticed some bumps on his left eye several months ago, and the bumps were accompanied by redness, irritation, tearing. I'm sorry, this was white type before, so let me just try to, uh, I'm just going to switch this. Uh, the bumps were uh, on his left eye. He'd noticed them for a few months, and it was, it was causing him some irritation, some redness, um, and some blurriness in his vision. He had initially presented to an outside ophthalmology clinic, and they, they saw him. They gave him some, some eye drops. The symptoms didn't resolve, and three months later, they'd noticed not only that the symptoms hadn't resolved, but also that, he, um, that, they'd seemed that these bumps had seemed to, gr to have grown. So they decided to do a conjunctival biopsy, and that initial path readout was read as suspicious for invasive squamous cell carcinoma. As a result, this patient was referred to, to this institution here where Dr. Mifflin saw him for further evaluation. On presentation here, uh, this is kind of what his patient history looked like. I'll just kind of jump through a few pieces here. A conjunctival neoplasm, he had cataracts in both of his eyes. A few medical conditions you can see there. Um, and the medications he was taking correspond with those, with those um, medical conditions. The only ocular medications that he was on was Tobradex and Azacite um, after the conjunctival biopsy. His exam, he was 2050 in his right eye, 2200 in his left eye. His intraocular pressures were good, and his pupils were equal round with no afferent pupillary defect. Um, on, on further exam, in the right eye, there was some moderate blepharitis um, some and a moderate cataract. But on the left side is where the real interesting pathology was. Um, he, in addition to the moderate blepharitis also here, he had some conjunctival thickening um, here in the, in the cantho lateral canthus, um, also kind of um, inferiorly and then infranasally here. Uh, this was more of a pigmented lesion, especially here with some pigment kind of extending down right there. So this is a picture of that infranasal lesion that was taken. As you can see, it's pigmented, it's round, it looks a little bit raised. Um, so it was, a, it was decided that they would be obtain an MRI of his orbit, face, and neck to see if there was any um, further progression of this, of this neoplasm. And then because of the location of, this, of these lesions in the, fornix, in the fornix, kind of the lateral cantle and involving the inferior lid, it was decided to refer this patient to, to Dr. Patel for surgery. So here's a picture of the MRIs you can see, um, and the, the conjunctival thickening. Let me just actually zoom it up a little bit here, and that kind of loses some of the quality, but you can see there's some conjunctival thickening kind of on the lateral side. It extended laterally into the fornix. It didn't appear to involve any of the extraocular muscles, in particular the lateral rectus, and no extension um, intracranially also. It was, it was determined that there was no evidence on this MRI of metastatic disease. So the surgery was performed, an excision of all of these neoplasms in the fornix, superior and inferiorly, and there was a removal of the, of the lesion on the lid with a reconstruction, stage one reconstruction of that lid. Also the conjunctival tumor infranasally was removed with conjunctival plasty and, and cryotherapy was done around the tumor edges. So now the histopathology came back and it was read as a malignant melanoma of the orbit arising from a pre-existing primary acquired melanosis. Because there was this question of squamous cell carcinoma versus now this, what they were reading is primary acquired melanosis. The, the sample was also sent for special immunohistochemistry, HMB45 and S100. This isn't the actual histology of the patient, but it's representative. So here you see these atypical melanocytes that are extending throughout the epithelium and into the beyond the base of the membrane. Here is an HMB45 stain, which is a stain for melanocytes and the S100 stain, which, which indicated that this was indeed melanocytic in nature. Yep. Yeah, there, was, there were several, th initially they did two biopsies, one kind of laterally on the conjunctiva, nasally, and one temporally. Um, removed all the, uh -huh. this was the pathology that's read for all of them, uh-huh. So what is primary acquired melanosis? It's a flat, non-cystic, pigmented lesion. It arises in the conjunctiva, the cornea, the caruncle, and it needs to be distinguished from 
the more common localized nevus and racial melanosis, especially in people with dark skin, racial melanosis seems to be ruled out. And it's usually, it's also flat, but it's usually bilateral. Um, the histology can also be further uh, differentiated as having, as being with or without atypia. So let's show some of what that atypia is. This is without atypia. You see these benign melanocytes here that are confined to the basal layer of the epithelium. Um, and that's typical of without atypia. Now with mild atypia, again, it's confined to this basal layer, not extending past the basement membrane or really too much into the epithelium. But uh, you see that they're kind of more atypical with nuclear, with uh, condensed chromatin at times and some nucle nucleoli. Now Pam with severe atypia, it is now extending, these atypical melanocytes are now extending into the epithelium, still not uh, going past the basement membrane, um, at which point it would be considered melanoma. Um, and you also see epithelioid cells, um, which can be typical of, of PAM with severe atypia. The epidemiology of primary acquired melanosis is it's more common in ca Caucasians, uh, women, and at an average age of around mid-50s is what I saw in most of the, the literature. Can, but however, it can affect all races and genders. And the incidence has also been uh, sub varied accounts of how, of how common this was. In one study by Glor and, and uh, Alexandricus where they saw thousands, over a thousand uh, samples in their institution, they thought the institution was around, th or the incidence was around 36%. Others think this may even be higher because, because of the asympt asymptomatic nature of primary acquired melanosis, oftentimes it doesn't present. So the clinical features, it's usually unilateral, distinguishing it from um, racial melanosis. It's flat, pigmented, in the locations we've talked about previously. The average diameter is, in one of the studies I saw, was about eight millimeters per lesion. And on average, there were around two um, of these lesions per eye when it, was, when it was seen. Almost always asymptomatic, sometimes some redness and mild irritation. And these do grow or can have the potential to grow. There's also the potential for progression of PAM to conjunctival melanoma, and this is what you worry about. Um, it is estimated that about 50 to 75 percent of conjunctival melanoma arises from primary acquired melanosis. The other uh, main player that, that gives rise to um, conjunctival melanoma is, is a, a nevus, and those uh, give rise to about 20 to 25 percent of conjunctival melanomas. Otherwise, it can also arise de novo. Here you see a patient here who had some PAM on the, here in the inferior fornix and kind of going into the canthus there. And this patient had this excised with cryotherapy and then was lost to follow up. And here you see this patient returning five years later after he's lost to follow up with this melanoma that had been um, developed. Here are other examples of, of primary acquired melanosis giving rise to melanoma. And in this case, you see an amelanotic lesion actually uh, of, of melanoma, which PAM can also give rise to. So I wanted to highlight a study that was done uh, by Shields et al. at um, the Wills Eye Institute. They had a, a study where they had 311 eyes they were looking at retrospectively that had primary acquired melanosis. The initial determination um, for treatment was 194 of these were just observed, thought that they were looked benign enough that they could be observed, and 107 were biopsied initially. Of those that were observed, um, at at an average of 32 months, 16% of these showed growth with no progression to melanoma. 5% of these showed growth with progression to melanoma at an average time of 56 months. Um, of the biopsied lesions, 27% of those recurred at an average time of 19 months, and 3% of those recurred progressing to melanoma at an average time of 39 months. So in determining what, uh, what predictive factors there were in looking at the initial PAM lesion of its progression and recurrence, they, they determined that the main predictive factor was clock hours, or how many clock hours the initial lesion occupied. Um, in a lesion that occupied one to two clock hours, it was less likely to progress and also less likely to recur after, after uh, excision. However, a lesion that occupied more than four clock hours was more likely, 6.8 times more likely to progress to melanoma, and a lesion that occupied 12 clock hours was over 20 times more likely to progress to melanoma than a one clock hour lesion. The other, the other predictive factor they found is, is the degree of atypia determined uh, your progression to melanoma. So PAM without atypia and PAM with mild atypia were both determined in this study and other studies to have no progression to melanoma. Now this uh, PAM with severe atypia 
was determined to have the potential to progress to melanoma, and there are varying accounts here. In the SHIELD study, uh, they, they noticed 13%. Other so studies have noted um, progression as high as 50 to 70%. So the overall progression from this study of primary acquired melanosis to melanoma was determined to be 3%. So what are the management strategies? One of the most important things I saw is that it's really important to do a detailed exam initially, detailing how many clock hours and making good, uh, dr large detailed drawings of these lesions. And it was actually, in a couple of the studies I saw, actually the drawings was uh, more reliable than the pictures in determining your, your um, next step in moving on to surgery or not. Here's just a, a way that the Shields paper set it out and they're thinking about how they would proceed with surgery or other treatment. They determined that those, those lesions that had less than one clock hour from their, from their sample looked like most of those didn't progress and they determined that those could be followed, just observed one to two times a year. But for the lesions that were kind of in the one to two clock hour range, it was now this murky range where, where it could go either way and they gave the patient the, op the option of surgery or no surgery. But once it passed two clock hours, they determined that surgery um, surgical excision with cryotherapy was the best method, and above five clock hours, a, a wider incisional biopsy with cryotherapy. Whenever there's um, a fear that this may already be melanoma, a no-touch technique where you don't actually manipulate the, the lesion, um, but, but making wider incisions and then switching your, your, um, your instruments at the time of excision and, then and switching when you close is the method that they, that they recommended and others recommended. For diffuse primary acquired melanosis, MAP biopsies with some cryotherapy, and then adjuvant therapy based on histology. And for corneal, corneal lesions, um, alcohol epithoriectomy seemed to work pretty well in topical mitomycin C. Mitomycin C was something that I saw in several places. Um, some people are using it. It seems for more extensive lesions, it's not as helpful, but it does show some promise for especially these corneal lesions. Now just very briefly, not extensively, the melanoma management strategies. Important to do a more extensive workup for this, a CT, blood test, et cetera, to determine the extent of systemic disease, and then a complete excision with cryotherapy using that no-touch technique that I talked about. Uh, also, radiotherapy is used frequently, proton external beam, brachytherapy at times is used, and oftentimes uh, exoneration is necessary. So back to our case. Mr. S was referred to radiation oncology during the time that of his of his surgery to the time he was uh, presented to radiation oncology, he'd noticed some increased blurry vision, um, had also developed some d double vision, especially in lateral gaze. And over the past few months, he noted at this time that he had had significant weight loss. So what they were thinking is they were considering proton therapy. They thought mitomycin C and the brachytherapy were maybe less ideal in this situation given the location and extent of the lesions. Um, and currently they're, they're planning on presenting this to the melanoma tumor board and proceeding from there based on their recommendation. So here's some of my references. And a special thank you to Dr. Mamlis and Warner, whose lab I've been working in for the past month, and to Dr. Mifflin and Patel for their workup of this patient. Any questions? Dr. Mamlis? Mm -hmm. And in initially, like I showed on the MRI, it didn't they didn't see from that MRI that there had been metastasis, but definitely that 40-pound weight loss speaks to something dangerous. Any more questions? <laughs> 
Yes. So PAM is, is, by definition, a flat lesion, and it is impossible to tell just by gross examination the difference between PAM with atypia and without atypia. And so a biopsy is, is necessary. If you, if, you were th if you were suspicious, I think that, and especially if this lesion is extending, like I showed those clock hours, more clock hours, then biopsy is probably the better route to go. Any more questions? All right, thank you very much. <laughs>